rituximab is a disease-modifying therapy for multiple sclerosis which depletes B cells similar to ocrevus and ofatumumab. Today, we'll talk about how it works, the major side effects, and results from clinical trials comparing it to other disease-modifying therapies. Let's have some fun. Just to give a quick disclosure, I don't have any financial conflict of interest with rituximab. I don't have any publications about rituximab or pending publications, but I am generally speaking a proponent of this medication. And also my institution, Kaiser Permanente, is actively involved in the Combat MS study, which is a collaboration with Sweden looking at the effects of rituximab in MS. So I do have a potential conflict of interest. Now, let's look at the normal FDA indications of rituximab. As you may know, rituxan, or truxema, or rituximab is very commonly used in MS, but is not actually FDA approved for MS. And the reason is because it's an older medication and was originally FDA approved for other conditions, such as certain cancers of the B cells. So the idea is this drug depletes B cells, so a cancer or abnormal growth of the B cells will respond to this medication, such as non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and chronic lymphocytic leukemia. It's also used in other autoimmune diseases, such as rheumatoid arthritis, although usually only in people with rheumatoid arthritis who don't respond to other more standard treatments, such as methotrexate or TNF-alpha blocking agents, such as Humira. It's also used in other autoimmune diseases, such as Wegener's granulomatosis, which normally affects the kidneys and other organs, along with microscopic polyangiitis. Now, all different types of dosages have been used of rituximab. In cancer, the dose is often based on body surface area, for instance, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, 375 milligrams per meter squared, which usually works out to around two grams in a typical adult, but it can vary quite a bit. And there are multiple cycles done. In rheumatoid arthritis, it's given 1,000 milligrams twice, two weeks apart and then repeated every six months. But often in rheumatoid arthritis, it's only given as needed, not necessarily chronically, certainly not forever. And the issue with multiple sclerosis is we're giving it really for prevention, and so we don't necessarily want to stop the medication, but that may increase the risk because of chronic use. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Now, one gram twice, two weeks apart, every six months, is actually a very, very high dose and possibly is overdosed and maybe unnecessary. One reason for this is that if you give someone 1,000 milligrams of rituximab, two weeks later, they likely won't have any detectable B cells. So why are we giving them another 1,000 milligrams? It's not exactly clear if that adds any benefit. And we have some data from the Combat MS study that I'll show you a little bit later covering that issue. Usually, the, the dose I personally give most of the time is 500 milligrams once every six months, at least for the first three years. Although sometimes I'll give people two doses to start two weeks apart if they have high disease activity or 1,000 milligrams once if I feel that they are higher risk in general. But there's really no standard dosing. Now, the way that it works is it destroys B lymphocytes. B cells are the type of white blood cell that normally make antibodies, the same type of abnormal antibodies that are found in the spinal fluid in about 90% of people with multiple sclerosis. So depicted to the left, you can see rituximab, which itself is an antibody, binds the B cell, and then that B cell undergoes antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity. Now, the rituximab antibody binds a certain receptor on the B cells called CD20, which is a protein-bound substance which is specific to B lymphocytes. And you can see the cell breaks down, and it's very effective in breaking down B cells. This is actually a screenshot of the laboratory results of one of my patients who received rituximab about five and a half months prior to this blood draw. And you can see that the CD19 and CD positive cells, which are the B cells, are zero, completely undetectable. And by the way, the half-life of rituximab is only on the order of two to three weeks. So the rituximab is long gone, even though the drug is out of the body. 
it's still effective because it just takes so long for the bone marrow to regenerate those cells. And we've seen rare cases of zero B cells even a year or even 18 months after the infusion, particularly with prolonged use, although this isn't common with just a few uses. Now, near the top of the chart, you can see that the CD3 T cells are also marked in yellow, but that's just because the percentage of T cells is artificially increased because the B cells are gone. That's not a true abnormal finding. Now, what about the side effects? I'm going to talk about a lot of different side effects in this presentation. But in reality, people with autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis tend not to get most of these side effects. And the reason is because this drug is used for so many different indications, including people with serious cancers that are getting multi-drug chemotherapy regimens that are much more toxic. So I'm going to talk about those side effects. But reason, realistically, the side effects that are most likely in someone with MS getting rituximab are infusion reactions like rash and hives and things like that during the infusion. And then there's a long-term risk of infections. Now, most people don't particularly get more infections with rituximab because it only affects that one type of white blood cell, the B cells. The rest of the immune system is completely normal. Some people do get more infections, usually minor infections like urinary tract infections, athlete's foot, superficial fungal infections, um, cold sores, things like that. But there's always a rare risk of a serious infection like a pneumonia. We typically don't see opportunistic infections. In other words, infections which would not normally occur in a healthy person with rituximab, but there's always a possibility of this. Also, in rare cases, we see cytopenias, or lowering of certain types of cell counts, like white blood cells or platelets or red cell plate, uh, counts, but this isn't very common. Uh, so again, the most common side effects would be just infusion reactions and sometimes infections. Now, this is the black box warning, and it talks about potentially very serious infections. One are very serious infusion reactions, which are much more common when this drug is used to treat lymphoma, such as mucocutaneous reactions. In other words, reactions involving both the skin and mucous membranes. I've never seen this in my career in multiple sclerosis. Also, the drug does not cause hepatitis B or hepatitis C, but if you have hepatitis B or C, you may have a decreased ability to fight off the virus and it may become activated and cause inflammation of the liver and worsening hepatitis or even liver failure. So people who have hepatitis B or C must take special precautions and generally must be cleared by a hepatologist prior to starting the drug. Also, there are rare cases of PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, a rare infection of the brain caused by the JC virus. Now, to my knowledge, there are no reported cases of PML in people with MS taking rituximab, but patients with other conditions, particularly if they're taking other immune suppressing medications, have gotten this infection. Extremely rare, again, not reported with rituximab, but it's on the product label. Now, let's start with the infusion reactions. The typical things we see are urticaria, hives, um, wheezing, rash, that kind of thing. But particularly uh, people with other uh, indications for the medication, such as lymphoma, they can have quite serious reactions. They can have anaphylaxis, low blood pressure. People have even had cardiac side effects, cardiac arrest, myocardial infarction. This is not something we would typically see with rituximab used to treat multiple sclerosis, but it has been reported. And there have been cases of fatal infusion reactions with the first dose in other conditions. The reason this is the case is because people with tumors like lymphoma, they have a lot of B cells throughout their body, much more than what is normal. And so when you get the drug, these cells are dying and there's just a massive cell lysis or cell destruction syndrome. And the cells are dumping out these contents and causing all of this inflammation. And it's very abnormal, much different from someone with multiple sclerosis or rheumatoid arthritis getting the drug. And that's why they tend to have milder reactions, although certainly some kind of reaction is quite common. Now, because of that, we usually give pre-medications. There are all kinds of different regimens, but usually we give steroids such as solumedrol, methylprednisolone, 125 milligrams to 500, Benadryl, Tylenol, and famotidine, which is Pepsid. And the reason for the famotidine is it's an H2 blocker, so it's a different type of antihistamine. This is a regimen that I typically give, but other people give all types of different regimens. 
usually we start the infusion very slowly and then increase the rate gradually. And if there's a problem, we stop the infusion, give a treatment such as Benadryl or steroids, and usually we would restart the infusion at half of the rate where the patient had the reaction. But it's not like the type of allergy where you can't get the medication anymore. Like with penicillin, if you have an allergy, you probably just should avoid penicillin. But with this medication, generally speaking, it's thought to be a cell lysis syndrome. In other words, an infusion reaction, not a true allergy. In other words, a reaction due to breakdown of the B cells, not to your immune system responding to the medication. And so often people get their worst reactions during the very first infusion, and then people subsequently do a lot better. I had one patient who had such a severe reaction with flushing, she had to be admitted to the hospital in order to get the medication slowly. But after that, she no longer had any other reactions whatsoever and has been on the drug for several years. So even with a severe first infusion reaction, often it's more mild or non-existent after that. But some people can have infusion reactions essentially forever. Now, hepatitis B and C reactivation, I already mentioned. This is most common in people receiving it for lymphoma. And the risk factors for getting this are getting other immunosuppressants, such as steroids or cytoxan. And sometimes hepatologists will recommend lamivudine, which is an anti-hepatitis B antiviral medication. But basically, if you have hepatitis B, it's reasonable to see your hepatologist prior to getting this medication. And same thing with hepatitis C, although now there's an effective treatment, drugs like Harvoni and other medications. And so probably it would be best to get a treatment, clear the virus prior to starting rituximab, assuming it's not urgent. Now, infections in general are more common with long-term use. As you'll see in the clinical trials, rituximab looks really, really good and really safe. But the reality is people aren't taking this medication for one or two years. They're taking it for long periods of time. And usually we test the B cells and they're normal, excuse me, they're low or they're gone. But we test the immunoglobins, immunoglobin G, immunoglobin M, and they're actually normal. And the reason for that is because B cells can turn into larger cells called plasma cells, which also make antibodies. Now, the plasma cells don't have the CD20 receptor and are immune to rituximab, and they create a lot of antibodies. But if you don't have B cells, you can't regenerate your plasma cells. And over time, they have a limited half-life, so you start losing your plasma cells, and the immunoglobin levels go down. And it's been shown that with lower immunoglobin G in particular, particularly when immunoglobin G is less than 500, especially for a prolonged period of time, the risk of infections increases. So a lot of doctors, including myself, we monitor the immunoglobins. And in rare cases, we will even give people intravenous immunoglobin to try to boost their immunoglobins up to a safe level and hold the rituximab to not cause further problems, particularly if the individual is having infections. Now let's look at some specific infections. In multiple sclerosis, people are afraid of PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which is most associated with Tysabri. But as I said, there are rare cases of PML in people taking rituximab. Now, no cases, to my knowledge, of people with MS taking rituximab who have gotten PML. But for instance, there's some cases in bone marrow transplant for a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma with rituximab acute lymphocytic leukemia with rituximab, <clears throat> and there, there are many cases that have been reported. Now, perhaps the most relevant data is from rheumatoid arthritis because it's also an autoimmune disease, and a lot of people are treated with just rituximab. So there was one case series with 129,000 people with rheumatoid arthritis who got rituximab, and four of them got PML, suggesting a risk of around 1 in 30,000. Now, three of those four were on other immunosuppressant drugs, but one was not. And so it's certainly possible, likely extremely rare, to get PML taking rituximab. Also, there was one reported case of PML in a patient taking Ocrevus, a drug very similar to rituximab. So I certainly think it's possible, but likely extremely rare if you're just taking rituximab. In this chart, you can see the risk of PML with other drugs, and you can see that it's much, much higher with natalizumab or Tysabri, greater than one in a thousand. And you can see with Ocrelizumab, with Ocrevus, there's one reported case and over 100,000 people treated. And that's a very similar drug to rituximab. Now, what about other infections? Again, this is not in multiple sclerosis. 
mostly people who had lymphoma, who received other immunosuppressants, but there are some opportunistic infections that have been reported, like West Nile virus, varicella, parvovirus B19, which can cause anemia, herpes simplex encephalitis, pneumocystis gyrorechiae, which can cause pneumonia, usually in people with AIDS or organ transplants, babesiosis, mycobacterial infections like tuberculosis. Again, not something we would typically see in people with multiple sclerosis, but they have been reported with this drug. What about vaccinations? Well, certainly it's safe to get killed vaccines because they're killed, and even with an immunosuppressed state, it's safe to receive them. But living vaccines are not recommended. For instance, the old shingles vaccine would not be recommended. The new shingles vaccine, Shingrix, is acceptable. And it's advised to not give the drug rituximab until four weeks after a live vaccine is given. So if you just got a live vaccine, it's advised to wait four weeks. Also, even with killed vaccines, rituxan gets rid of the B cells, which are really important in vaccine response. And some studies suggest that this drug and similar drugs may decrease response to the pneumonia and tetanus vaccines and likely other vaccines as well. So even if it's safe to give the vaccines, they may not be quite as effective. Now, cardiovascular or heart side effects are not typically seen in people with autoimmune diseases, but people with lymphoma who get this massive cell toxicity have been reported to have serious cardiac events and atrial fibrillation, which is an abnormal arrhythmia, and even sudden cardiac death. Again, this is not something that I've seen or that my colleagues have seen. There's no direct cardiotoxicity with this drug, but in people with massive tumors with a lot of cell breakdown, there have been quite serious cardiac side effects during the first infusion. Same thing with renal or kidney side effects. The idea, if you have a lot of cells that are breaking, da breaking down, you can get this cell lysis syndrome, and some of those materials can kind of clog up the renal tubules and cause kidney failure. Never seen this, never heard of this in multiple sclerosis with rituximab, but it has been reported in other conditions. Same thing with bowel obstruction in patients with cancer getting rituximab and other chemotherapy. A serious infusion reaction with bowel injury and bowel obstruction has been reported. Again, I've never seen this or heard of this in my career related to rituximab, and it's used for treating autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis. Now, what about laboratory abnormalities? Now, it's a little bit confounded because a lot of people receiving rituximab get other medications as well, especially with lymphoma. But things like lymphopenia, low lymphocytes, and neutropenia, low neutrophils, which are types of white blood cells, has been reported. Anemia, low red blood cell counts. Now, these things are not things that I would see commonly, but I believe I have seen rare cases of thrombocytopenia or low platelets, which could potentially cause bleeding with rituximab. I don't think it's very common, and often they're not extremely low, and I haven't seen any patients who've had any serious bleeding events, but I have seen some rare cases of low platelets, which are likely related to the drug. Now, hypogamma globulinemia, or low immunoglobins, does occur with rituximab, but usually only with long-term use, as I mentioned, and that is a potential safety issue with long-term use. <laughs> Again, the drug may be safe for one or two years, but with prolonged use, the risk may increase. Now, in terms of pregnancy, usually we don't give this drug during pregnancy. There have been rare cases of low B cells in the infant. And of course, the infant is already kind of immunosuppressed, so we don't want the infant to have a weaker immune system than normal. So usually we wouldn't give this drug in pregnancy unless absolutely necessary. We know that rituxan crosses the placenta in monkeys, but is not teratogenic. In other words, it doesn't directly cause birth defects in monkeys. But it's thought that the drug doesn't really cross the placenta until a little bit later on. Early on, it probably, during the first trimester, probably does not effectively cross into the placental barrier. Um, me personally, I advise women to not get pregnant for at least four to six weeks after getting the drug. On the product label, it actually recommends one year, but this isn't really based on anything. Uh, a lot of women get pregnant taking this drug recently, and it makes sense that the half-life is relatively short, only two to three weeks. We think the drug does not cross the placental barrier early on. But again, you know, talk to your own doctor if you have to make this kind of difficult decision. In terms of nursing, rituximab is secreted into the breast milk of monkeys and humans, but in relatively small amounts. And it's believed that rituximab is not readily absorbed through the gastrointestinal tract and hence does not necessarily enter the infant circulation. So there have been women who have taken this drug 
prior to breastfeeding and you know with relatively good outcomes but again you would have to talk to your own provider about this difficult issue now what about some of the clinical trials this is a little data from the Hermes trial in uh, relapsing MS and you can see placebo on the left and rituxan on the right and you can see that rituxan has more infusion reactions chills and itching pruritus pyrexia which is fever uh, and fatigue, things like that. So that's definitely more common in people getting rituximab. That makes sense. Now, in terms of other adverse reactions, if you look at sort of the bottom of the page, nasopharyngitis, which is basically a cold, is only slightly higher in rituximab, 20.3% versus 17.1% in placebo. Upper respiratory tract infection, 18.8% in rituxan versus 17.1% in placebo. Urinary tract infections were a little bit more, 14.5% in rituxan versus 8.6% in placebo. Influenza was actually a little bit more in the placebo, 11.4% versus 5.8%, likely due to random chance. But in this particular study, there were no serious infections. And so again, rituxan looks very good, at least in the short run. However, in children, particularly with other autoimmune diseases, it may be a little bit more dangerous. So this is a caveat I want to give, and this is based on a case series from the University of California, San Francisco, about children with other autoimmune diseases, not multiple sclerosis, neuromyelitis optica, NMDA encephalitis, oxyclonus myoclonus syndrome, Rasmussen's encephalitis. These are rare and serious autoimmune diseases, and they had a pretty bad safety profile three kids with serious infusion reactions with anaphylaxis, two fatal infections, one with cytomegalovirus, which is an opportunistic infection which would not occur in a healthy person, one with staph toxic shock syndrome, and they also had two disabling infections, CMV retinitis causing vision loss, and toxic shock with liver injury, hepatic encephalopathy. They did not have any cases of PML. So the safety in pediatrics may not be as good as in adults, although these children were likely much sicker overall than the typical adult with multiple sclerosis getting this medication. Now, one thing that I wanna say is that even though there were a lot of side effects with rituximab, it was actually quite effective in this patient group. And they looked at the disability before and after the treatment, and they used the modified Rankin scale, which is zero to six. And basically, zero to two would be no or low amount of disability. And only 17.4% were in this category prior to treatment, but 73.9% were after the treatment. So the drug was effective in these conditions, but much more dangerous than in adults, in my opinion. Now, we usually have certain safety monitoring for people taking this drug. Usually prior to starting the medication, I check a hepatitis panel just because if you have hepatitis B or C, you have to take care of that. I check baseline counts of the B cells and immunoglobins and a complete blood count along with liver function test and creatinine, which is a measure of kidney function. I also look for varicella immunoglobins to see if someone is immune to shingles, which is a known infection that can occur with rituximab. If someone has heart problems, I may get an electrocardiogram. And then also I'll check a urine test just to make sure there's not a brewing urinary tract infection that could be worsened with the treatment. And prior to each dose, I usually get B cell counts and immunoglobins and urine tests and basic blood counts and liver function tests. And in children, you know, because they may not have been exposed to cytomegalovirus, I may actually get some other tests as well, and I may give a body surface area based dosing, depending on the indication for the medication. Now let's look at some clinical trials. So Hermes was the trial in relapsing multiple sclerosis. Olympus was the trial in progressive multiple sclerosis, primary progressive multiple sclerosis. And I'm not going to go over it, but it's kind of similar to the trial Oratorio uh, for the drug Ocrevus. And then we can look at the combat MS data. I don't have the data for that trial yet, but I have some of the earlier data from Sweden published in 2018. And also the revitalized trial, which is intrathecal into the spinal column of rituximab done at Johns Hopkins University. So let's look at Hermes first. This is an interesting study over 48 weeks where they gave rituximab one gram twice, two weeks apart. So what's interesting here is normally you would repeat rituxan after 24 weeks, but they did not. They just gave it once and then followed them for close to a year. So potentially the drug wasn't even really that effective for the entire year. 
But if you look at the graph of enhancing lesions, you can see in blue is the rituximab and in gray is the placebo. The new enhancing lesions went down quickly over about three months and stayed down during the entire year, even though it was only given once at the beginning of the trial. Just coincidentally, uh, just by random chance, the individuals getting rituximab had more active lesions at the start. Uh, again, this was just purely by random chance, but they still did much better than those receiving the placebo. And this was highly statistically significant. Now, this is a busy slide, but if you look at the mean number of relapses, you can see it was, it, it was 0.37 in placebo versus 0.16 in rituxan. And so that's over a 50% difference. And again, they didn't even really give the drug properly. They only gave it once. So that's pretty impressive. Now, this is the Olympus trial looking at progressive multiple sclerosis. And they give one gram intravenously twice, two weeks apart, every six months. So they gave a high dose similar to what is on the label for rheumatoid arthritis. And this, again, was primary progressive multiple sclerosis. And here, there was really no difference between the drug and placebo. Rituximab is the lower line. So the proportion of individuals who had increasing disability was slightly lower than placebo, but it was not statistically significant. The p-value was only 0.14. However, if you looked at a selected subgroup in this study, those who were age 50 and younger and who had at least one active lesion, at least one gadolinium positive lesion that took up the contrast dye, there was actually a big difference in disability progression. So only about 25% had worsening disability who got the drug versus over 50% getting placebo. And this was highly significant with a p-value of 0 0.0088. Now, one thing I should mention is that overall, the Olympus trial had older patients than the oratorial trial. So arguably, this subgroup is more comparable to the oratorial trial used to study Ocrevus in secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. And that may be why this subgroup looks so good, because these are the best candidates of the medication. That doesn't necessarily mean that people who are older could not benefit. It just seemed that in this particular trial, they did not show any effect whereas the younger patients who had active lesions did. Now, what about revitalize? I actually uh, know one of the doctors who was involved in this, Dr. Pavan Bhargavi at Johns Hopkins University. And their idea was that progressive multiple sclerosis, specifically secondary progressive multiple sclerosis, seems to be linked to abnormal meningeal follicles that contain B cells. And so the idea is that you have this inflammation that's sort of behind the blood-brain barrier. And so intravenous rituximab may not get to it. And it's well known that rituxan doesn't really cross the blood-brain barrier very well. But what if you do a spinal tap and then inject the rituximab directly into the spinal column so that it gets into the central nervous system? This was the ideal of the trial. But unfortunately, even doing a pilot trial, they didn't really get much change in cerebrospinal fluid biomarkers like neurofilament or much of an effect on central nervous system tissue B cells. So they didn't go forward with a full trial. So it was basically ineffective. Although it's possible that intrathecal rituximab could be used in the future, perhaps in some people who may not be great candidates, either because they're susceptible to infections or other reasons for intravenous rituximab. Now, this is the Swedish registry published in JAMA in 2018. Again, there's an ongoing combat MS study, so we should get more data between Sweden and Southern California Kaiser Permanente. But the Swedish data is just incredible. You can see here that only six individuals had relapses. An annual rate of clinical relapses of 0.03, extremely low and lower than all other medications. This would be a probability of 1 in 33 of having a relapse in a given year. That's very, very effective. Also, if they looked at the MRI scans, they saw similarly impressive results with only two individuals having new gadolinium enhancing lesions. In other words, two out of 104, less than one in 50. Again, better than all other medications they compared this drug to. And here you can just look at survival of the drug. And you can see that rituximab, labeled RTX, is sort of like the black hole of multiple sclerosis disease modifying therapies. Patients tend to get on rituximab and just stay on rituximab, whereas these other drugs 
FGL, fingolimod, or gelenia, people tend to drop out for various reasons. NTZ, natalizumab, people become JC virus antibody positive. DMF, dimethylfumarate, you know, maybe people have side effects or they have relapses. INJ stands for injectables such as copaxone, glitopa, or the beta interferon formulations, Avonex, Rebif, beta serum, Extavia, etc. People tend to stop those types of medications, whereas people tend to stay on rituximab for whatever reason. Now, of course, this could also represent the bias and preference of the doctors in Sweden as well. But it is quite impressive how many people stay on this drug, and you can see the follow-up time in days, 1,460 days, that's several years. So it's very successful. Now, one interesting thing from this database is they found that the 500 milligram dose may actually be better than the 1,000 milligram dose. I'll read a quote from the article. Although the different maintenance dose groups, 500 versus 1,000 milligrams every six months, were not identical regarding all baseline parameters, including age, which might have influenced the results, our data suggested no major difference regarding efficacy based on these different dose regimens. Furthermore, slightly fewer adverse events per patient year of treatment occurred in the 500 milligram group. This suggests that maybe the 500 milligram dose is actually the better dose, giving you equal efficacy with better safety. So we've really gone for one gram twice in rheumatoid arthritis to 500 milligrams once every six months. And there's more. There's some evidence that the efficacy of rituximab is sustained even longer than six months. And many doctors, particularly if their patients are on the drug for a long period of time, are giving it less often. And that may prevent the immunoglobins from becoming too low. And that may improve the safety of the drug. And it seems that not a lot of people have relapses, even if they haven't taken the drug for a long time, particularly if they've been on rituximab for several years. But of course, we'll have to follow up the data from the Combat MS study. Now, I'll go ahead and put some references in the comments below. And if you have any specific questions, please go ahead and ask in the comments below. And if you have any suggestions for future videos, I'd love to hear that as well. Thank you for your time.